Hello, and thank you for joining us today at IFFGD's 2021 virtual advocacy event. Today, we are focusing on advocacy, ensuring that advocates have all the tools and answers they need to successfully contact Congress. And with us today is IFFGD's Washington Representative, Philip Gogolis II, to discuss more about how Congress works. Thank you for being with us today, Philip. Thanks, Marissa. Glad to be here. Can you start by giving us a brief overview of the general structure of the United States government? Sure thing. Uh, and thank you again for having me. It's good to be with you today. And hello to everybody who is joining us and participating in our virtual advocacy event this year. It's greatly appreciated that you are getting involved. So Marissa, the structure of the US government is broken down into three different branches. You have the executive branch, which is the president and the administration. They enforce the laws. You have the judiciary branch, which on the federal level is made up of the Supreme Court and federal courts. They interpret laws. And then you have the legislative branch, which is Congress. And that's where we do a lot of our work with advocacy and engagement. And we do that because Congress uh, has the power to create laws. They draft specific policy recommendations. They draft different laws and uh, priorities, and they have oversight over federal agencies. So it's always good for us to be engaged with them because they're the ones who decide what policies get passed and also how much money gets spent around the federal government. Thank you. That was such a great general overview of the United States government. And of course, if anyone has any further questions, you can feel free to include those in the chat as we will be doing a Q&A at the end of this presentation. Um, and you mentioned that specifically we are working with and contacting Congress in our advocacy efforts. Can you tell viewers a little bit more about how Congress itself is organized? Sure. Um, so Congress is broken up into two different houses. You have the House of Representatives and the Senate. The Senate is composed of 100 members, two from each state. So it doesn't matter if you live in a high population state like California or a low population state like Montana or Delaware, you have the same number of senators, which is two. On the House side, you have one member from each district and there are 435 members of the House. That's where population matters. You have states like California, uh, which are high population that have 53, I believe, uh, individual House offices. States like Florida have 25 uh, because of the large, or 27 because of the large number of population there, as opposed to smaller states like Delaware or Montana or the Dakotas, where they only have one member of the House. And those districts get rearranged every 10 years based off of the census and population. So we're really at, at, a, at an interesting time because uh, some of the districts that are currently configured are going to be redone before the next Congress. So we're definitely going to see some additions and subtractions based off of population. Members of the House are elected every two years, so they don't have the luxury of the Senate who are elected for six years. So every two years, the whole House, all 435 seats are up for election, while on the Senate side, only about roughly a third are up every two years. So the Senate is a little um, more nuanced and, and they have uh, longer time periods because they serve six years as opposed to just two years on the House side. Thank you so much for telling us about that. And I know that within Congress, there are different committees. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the committees and why they are so important, especially in advocacy efforts? Sure thing. So as I mentioned, why we deal with Congress is they have unique authority to create and draft specific policies. They have the ability of, and they have the responsibility of oversight for federal agencies, but they also have control over the purse strings. So they're the ones who decide how much money is spent at different federal agencies, how much money the National Institutes of Health receives, how much money the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention receives, with as well as specific recommendations on how to spend some of that money. So within that uh, framework, we have different congressional committees of jurisdiction that we work with. On the House and Senate side, both have appropriation committees which they are the ones who decide how much money is spent across different federal agencies. On the Senate side, you have the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. That's a committee of jurisdiction that has oversight over federal health agencies, as well as other programs. They work with the Department of Education, they work with HHS, 
um, across all of their different areas as well. And it's because they have that oversight of that committee that we work very closely with them because they also help implement some specific policies for federal agencies and for our communities. On set aside, you also have the finance committee, which deals with Medicare and Medicaid policies and general tax provisions as well. So they have a very important role in deciding specific health care policies as well, working with the health committee uh, with jurisdiction and oversight. On the House side, you have the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is a complement to the Senate Health Committee. They're the committee of jurisdiction with oversight over the National Institutes of Health, over the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, FDA, and other federal uh, agencies. You then have the Ways and Means Committee, which is to complement to the Finance Committee. They oversee Medicare, Medicaid, as well as some tax, uh, tax issues. So, we specifically work with those six committees because those decisions that they make have a great um, have a great bearing on on different things for our community appropriations, how much money is spent on research or for public education and awareness programs, help and energy and commerce finance and ways and means over specific policies and implementations. The Affordable Care Act worked its way through all of those committees, for example, uh, issues on uh, Patient access works its way through those committees as well. So those are the committees with health policy oversight, and they advance those specific priorities while appropriation covers the specific amount of money that's spent at each federal agency. Thank you so much for that great overview. And it's wonderful to know that Congress is so heavily organized and that there are specific committees, specific representatives that really have more of a say within certain parts of advocacy so that we can really target our advocacy efforts and know where we'll make the most impact. Right, that's definitely true. It does help us to be very strategic in our advocacy efforts, who serves on relevant committees and who's able to really make a difference. Now, that's not to say that advocating with every senator or every house member is not important because how these members of these committees make decisions is based off of feedback from their colleagues as well. So we work very, importantly on creating the national grassroots advocacy network where we have folks from all across the country engaging with their members but at the same time we also have some of these strategic relations relationships that help us advance some of our specific priorities that is such a great point that any advocacy efforts are important as as you said these um, representatives and senators speak with each other and help each other make decisions so even if you're advocating to someone who isn't specifically involved in a committee their opinion may have a big impact on other committee members when they discuss and talk about the different policies and advocacy um, needs. And in addition to our advocacy efforts, talking to the different committees and the representatives, we often ask and we ourselves as advocates speak to members of Congress about the activities of different federal agencies. And I know you briefly touched on that when you talked about where the committees have their different jurisdictions and what they work with and work in. Why is it so important to talk about these federal agencies with Congress members? So it's critically important because of the two roles that the House and the Senate serve, specifically, again, those six committees that we've talked about. Appropriators who serve on that appropriations committee have the distinct power to decide how much money a federal agency receives. Because of that, federal agencies are always very responsive to the desires, the needs, the questions of members of the Appropriations Committee, because they're the ones who decide how much money is afforded or available for research or for different things. Because they have the power of the purse, it gives them, Congress, the ability to influence some of the process and to make specific recommendations for federal agencies. They will allocate a certain amount of funding and will sometimes say, you know, we encourage you to use this funding to do a little more research or to do a little more work in this area. And then the other committees, such as Energy and Commerce, Health, Ways and Means and Finance, they're critically important because as we are seeing now with the new administration, there are these different nominees for different uh, important roles within federal agencies. And on the Senate side, all of these nominees have to go through confirmation hearings where they sit in front of the committees of jurisdiction. For example, the nominee for Secretary of Health and Human Services 
is going to be going in front of the Health Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, where he'll answer questions from committee members about what his vision is for the agency, how to respond to the current pandemic and, and what he believes the role of his agency is. That's important because now that committee will continue to follow up with the nominee about different decisions that he makes if he is confirmed and then follow up with some specific recommendations. So the reason why we engage with these committees is, is to really serve as a check on the federal agencies, make sure that the things that we are discussing with our members of Congress, you know, the federal agencies are following the guidance. If we're asking for increased funds or, or if we're making specific recommendations about how to move forward, um, you know, one example, and I'll, I know that uh, this will get in more into this a little later on, but, you know, one of our requests is for the CDC's chronic disease education and awareness program. And what's important about that is Congress will provide the funding for that. But they also want to make sure that the federal agency positively responds to what their recommendations are. So the agencies rely on Congress for the funding, as well as uh, some recommendations about what they would like to see with that funding. And then agencies respond, hopefully most times in a positive way to what con uh, Congress's recommendations are. If they don't, Congress has the power to bring in uh, federal agency heads and ask them why they aren't doing what Congress has asked them to do and really motivate them to adopt and make decisions that pass congressional intent. Thank you so much for that overview of that, Philip. And um, as you briefly mentioned, some of the agencies such as CDC and NIH, um, can you just briefly talk about a few of these agencies that we discuss and just a little bit about them for people who may not be as familiar with what the CDC, NIH, and other agencies are. Sure. So we work very closely with the National Institutes of Health. Uh, the National Institutes of Health is the premier medical research agency in our country. Um, over the past year, you might have seen a lot of Dr. Fauci on TV or heard Dr. Fauci's name. He's one of the directors at an institute at the National Institutes, Institutes of Health. Um, they support medical research. They're divided into different specialty institutes, which cover different parts. Um, we're very fortunate that Cecile is an advisory council member for the NIDDK um, Institute, which covers research on GI issues as well as digestive uh, issues as well. So each institute has a specific role in supporting uh, research. What they do is that basic science research. What's then critically important is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is the public health organization for uh, our government. They're tasked with making sure that information is being shared. Again, you, over the past year, you might hear different things about what CDC guidelines are, or recommendations are in terms of how to deal with the pandemic. That's influenced by the science that's done at NIH, but NIH doesn't release these different types of guidelines or recommendations. That comes from the CDC. So the CDC is critically important because they take the important research and the science from NIH and they share that with the community. It's very important for us to work with them as well because it allows us to share uh, recent breakthroughs and new discoveries on the basic science for our communities with medical professionals, with patient communities to better understand things and why we're very active in that chronic disease education and awareness program. The Food and Drug Administration, they're the ones who regulate therapies, approve treatments. So they have a very critical role as well, where they rely on the science that's done at NIH and they work to a limited extent with CDC in terms of uh, disseminating information. All three are critically important for us because FDA also has um, different guidelines that they release when it comes to uh, therapies and, and other things that are important to our communities. Thank you so much for that great overview of all these federal agencies. And of course, this is just three of the key ones we tend to work with, um, but all federal agencies are important in this process. And as different policies and priorities come forward, we tend to work with others and really the options are endless as far as what we can advocate on for the benefit of the patient community. That's right, there are, are any number of other uh, federal healthcare or federal agencies that we work with, such as the Department of Defense or the Department of Veterans Affairs that have key decision-making 
and key programs that benefit our communities. Uh, but a lot of the work that we do is focused within HHS at uh, NIH, CDC, and FDA. But there are any number of federal agencies that we work very closely with to advance the priorities of our communities. Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much for taking the time to share with us this important information about how Congress works. And for anyone who's just tuning in, you can watch um, this video and more at IFFGD's 2021 Virtual Advocacy Event page on IFFGD.org. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.